Welcome to True Crime Garage. Wherever you are, whatever you are doing, thanks for listening. I'm your host, Nick, and with me, as always, is a man that told me nobody goes there anymore because it's too crowded. He is the captain. Yeah, and you can't find a place to park. It's good to be seen, and it's good to see you. Thanks for listening. Thanks for telling a friend. This week, we have selected Sleepy Bear by Workforce Brewing in Plainfield, Illinois. Garage grade, four and a half bottle caps out of five. When we featured this yesterday, I failed to mention coffee. There's a good hint of roasty coffee here that mixes well with the chocolate and caramel flavors. And thanks to the following for going to our website, truecrimegarage.com, and contributing to our beer fund. First up, thanks to Julie in Rio Rancho, New Mexico. And a big cheers, mates, to Jennifer in Covington Township, Pennsylvania. Next up, we have a shout to Matthew and Madeline in North Augusta, South Carolina. Also in South Carolina, we have Lisa in Fort Mill. And put on your tin cap and a big cheers to Maggie, a conspiracy theorist in Brooklyn, New York. Next, we thank Kat in West Covina, California. And last but certainly not least, we have Harry in Finland. So thanks for the rounds of beers, friends. Make sure you check us out at truecrimegarage.com and on social media. And for all of our old episodes, make sure you check us out on the Stitcher app and check out our show Off the Record, which is on Stitcher Premium. And that is enough of the beers, Nias. That's right, everybody. Gather around, grab a chair, grab a beer. Let's talk some true crime. On Wednesday, July 11, 2007, police in a news conference pinpointed Lisa's husband, Craig Stebick, as the sole person of interest in Lisa Stebick's disappearance. Plainfield Police Chief Donald Bennett said Craig Stebick has been of minimal assistance to detectives and refused to participate in searches, in part leading them to name him as a person of interest. Plus, they said he has refused their repeated request to talk to his children, who are amongst the last people to see their mother alive. Twice he has refused requests to have police talk with these children, said Bennett, adding that such action has clearly hampered the investigation. It is the police's belief that the children have viable info that could assist them in their investigation. Craig Stebick and his children, somewhere along this investigative timeline, they cut off all contact with Lisa's family. Smell that. Mm -hmm. Smells a little fishy. Yeah, this is a bad situation. Not only are they not working with the investigators and his children, you know, perceivably, we can believe that this is at his own doing or not talking with investigators as well. But we also find out at some point they're not even communicating with Lisa's family, which I understand that there might be some bad blood, especially with her missing. But that shouldn't should not really change the interaction between his children and her family. Right. Now, this case, Lisa Stebbick's disappearance and what later police would pretty much officially announce as suspected foul play, and they even go out and say they don't believe Lisa is alive. This case was receiving a good deal of statewide news publicity and national news coverage in the beginning. But as we have seen in other cases and in other states, eventually there are distractions. And I mean, cases that take priority in the news spotlight Mm -hmm. and cases that took the spotlight came relatively quickly and became big news over Lisa's case. And this is as follows on June 14th, 2007, Christopher Vaughn murdered his wife and kids in Shanahan, Illinois. Chris, use a piece of shit on October 28th, 2007, Stacy Peterson vanishes from Bolingbrook, Illinois. Drew Peterson, use a piece of shit. Then, as longtime Garage listeners very well know, in one of the cases that fascinates me the most, the February 2nd, 2008 Lane Bryant store shootings in Tinley Park, Illinois. Unknown suspect, use a piece of shit. Now, even though this case faded from the spotlight, seeking justice for Lisa needs to go on, and I think there are a lot of important questions in this case. So let's go through some of these here, Captain. 
So the divorce is in full swing as it appears. This is often a red flag, but in this case, it seems clear that both parties wanted the divorce and both were moving forward with it. Now, there could be some motives inside all of this, right? The police were called to the house. Again, normally a red flag, but here it appears there was no type of physical altercation. Right. And Craig was the one who called the police, not the later missing individual, Lisa. Yeah, I agree with that. But also we have somebody that used to be a private investigator. This could be some kind of a setup. Yes. And then we also have this situation about what we now know is probably reported as fact that Lisa was dating another man at some point during the course of this separation. Mm -hmm. It seems like the, the question here that we have to go back to, if this would be a motive for her to disappear on Craig's part is one, did he even know about this other individual? Mm -hmm. Was it even something that was serious? And I get that it doesn't have to be something serious for him to, fly off the handle and do something crazy. But does one, does he even know about it? And two, if he does know about it, does he even care? Is this something that even bothers him? As said, they're both moving forward with separating from one another. And ultimately it seems like the care of their children is the concern of both of them. Yeah. But we have mixed, you know, feelings there as well. We have somebody saying, Hey, at one point we have them saying, Hey, we're going to have, joint custody mm-hmm. right with with the mother lisa having the primary custody or primary house is where they'd be living mm-hmm. but then that seems like that's going to change well it's like she changed her mind on that i question that a little bit because of a few things one i don't think it was ever filed in a way that she would be the sole caretaker of these children I wonder if this is a situation where we have a divorce moving forward and she's saying, I'm going to be the main caregiver of these children. Well, what if he, what if he disputes this at some point, her lawyer asking for information to what, what do we have to point out that you should be the main caretaker of these children? Right. Because the whole thing you have to ask yourself, if she truly did feel that he was an unfit father, And the thing that I keep going back to, and I'm probably going to take some criticism for this, but I want everybody to keep in mind, we don't know 100% what was going on inside those four walls. We don't know what was going on 100% under the roof of that home, Mm -hmm. right? So if she truly did feel that he was unfit or dangerous, a danger to their children, she did have some control under the fact that they were still all living under the same roof. Right. And she does seem to be a caring mother. That would take that into account along the way. The other thing is, I don't, I don't hesitate to say that I do think that there was some kind of verbal abuse or belittling going on. I know that there are talks that she was attending counseling at a place that is pretty much structured for battered women. Right. One thing though, we got to keep in mind, usually those places keep their records sealed for good reason. So I don't know that we have an official from that agency coming forward and saying, yes, she was seeking counseling here. Or if this is just something that her family is saying or friends suspected along the way or something she said she might seek in the future. Yeah. And maybe it's just counseling in general. Mm -hmm. But one has to wonder, look, there's going to be all kinds of rumors that come out. Your friend goes missing and it becomes... Okay, well, I do remember that one time mm-hmm. that that she said her husband was mean. I do remember that. You know what I mean? Like, right. And now you're trying to you're trying to work backwards. Your friend's missing. Now let's work backwards. And now you have this husband, which yeah, it's odd. He's trying to keep everything close to to, to the vest, but who knows what's been said about him? And then at that point, you go, okay, my wife is missing, and that sucks. But I need to take care of myself. I need to take care of my family. I need to make sure they're all right, because if I go away, what's going to happen to them? The other thing that could be going on here, and this is much darker than anything that we've talked about, is we see a couple things inside this relationship, a couple things going on in this dynamic that we are aware of and that is fact. So right. let's go through that real quick and look at it through this angle. And this might be uncomfortable to talk about, but it's a possibility. We have Craig, who is the, I mean, he's the breadwinner by far. 
in this situation. 80 grand a year, roughly compared to 10 grand a year. Right. Now, is that, that doesn't mean, I don't mean that to suggest that Lisa was any less of a person or earner than her husband. No. What I'm getting at is, was that a situation controlled by this man? Was that a situation where he goes out and he makes a good deal of money and he's reminding her day after day, you got this job over here. It's not going to pay the bills. I'm in control of this situation. You need me. You need me for financial support and you need me to keep this roof over our heads. Even if it's joint custody and they award her uh, child support money, it's not going to be, even though he makes a lot more money, Mm -hmm. it's not going to be enough for her to live off of. Right. And now we certainly know that she was capable of earning more. I mean, she has a degree. She worked a second job for a while. I would love to know what happened with that second job. It sounds to me, some of the things I've read, Captain, sounds like it was a fill-in position that she was filling in for someone. Right. Or was this a situation where Craig goes, you know what? I'm tired of you being gone at night. You're not allowed to be gone at night. You can work your job during the day. I expect you to be home during the evenings. Right. I would love to know the situation going on there because you have to wonder with this being their second time around on the divorce proceedings, was she making plans to better her financial situation leading up to the eventual separation again? Yeah. And if, if he's telling her not to work the job that goes back into the controlling factor, I, I just think, um, somebody that's going to be that controlling of somebody you think they're actually going to file for divorce. Mm-hmm. It doesn't make a lot of sense, but again, that could be playing a certain hand. Let me file for the divorce. Let me seem like I'm okay with it. Yeah. Again, a controlling factor, mm-hmm. right? He's the one that decides when they're going to file for divorce. He's the one that decides when the police are going to be called. Also, we know the situation of her cell phone. He's in charge of the cell phone. Both of the cars are registered to Craig, none to Lisa. Right. You know, it, it, so you do have some things in here where it looks like we have a guy that's kind of controlling the whole situation, this whole family. And then later on, yeah, or, or is it a logical thing? I'm going to put the car in my name because I'm paying for the tags mm-hmm. because I'm paying for the license plates because I'm paying the insurance because I'm paying the gas money because I'm paying for the car. Right. Is it just a logical thing? Well, why would I put it in somebody else's name if it's mine? Well, and some have cited money troubles as a possible motive while we're on the talks of motives here. Mm -hmm. Apparently, they did have a second mortgage on the house, and they were getting ready to separate, but they owed quite a bit more on the home than the value of that home. Well, that's always good. Yeah. Then we have the eviction papers. And again, this, this thing is a tricky motive here, too just like everything else. We have the situation where she has filed for a petition of eviction of this man who's probably paying most of the bills as we discussed with the amount of money that he's right. And that, that part's not tricky. I mean, if you're paying all the bills and you got an eviction notice from the person not paying the bills, uh, I'd be super pissed. Mm -hmm. I'd be, I'd be captain America pissed. Well, that's where you wonder, that's where people are going to say, hey, he must have known about this. And when he found out, he lost it. Right. But that's that's the weird speculation, because do we know if he knew about this? His claims, he says he never knew about this paperwork until after she went missing. Right. So we cited the money troubles, possible money troubles. We cited the eviction papers and the normal red flags we would expect with a divorce as it's going on. We also have a situation, Captain, where police announced two very vague but interesting things to the media over the years. One, they have ruled out several people, and what I mean by this exactly is they have talked to several people. They're saying, we've ruled other people out in this disappearance. We can't rule him out. That makes me wonder about this individual that she was dating, right. this unnamed man. He's In the papers, he's unnamed. Mm -hmm. This, to me, knowing his age, the age is reported in the media. This points to me that law enforcement knows who this guy is. Right. And they've probably talked to him. They've investigated him. He would be on that list. And if they're saying that we've cleared everyone else, well, then that man that she dated, again, we don't know how many times, he must be on that list of people that have been cleared 
by law enforcement. Yeah, I think that's safe to assume. And then two, Craig Stebick is law enforcement's sole person of interest. We know this from a statement released to the public. And I think that this has to stem from three key factors. One, Craig is believed to be the last person to see Lisa, or at least he reports having seen her at their home and hearing her leave sometime around 6 p.m. that night. Right. We don't have anybody else to say that they saw her after that time. We don't have any activity on her credit cards or cell phone after that time. Right. Two, the small amount of blood found on the tarp in Craig's truck. I mean, that's just, that blood just doesn't magically appear. Again, you're not going to be able to get a murder charge out of that, but it seems awfully suspicious. Then three, it seems like law enforcement have good reason to believe that Craig Stebick has access to places that might make it easy for him to dispose of Lisa's body and hide evidence. We talked about the property that his family owns out of state. We also have a situation where this guy, he's a pipe fitter. He moves around to different job sites. You know, we just talked about a case last week where right. the husband buried the, the wife and children at one of his job sites. Yeah. So what happened to Lisa? You know, did Craig do it? Does Craig not submitting to a lie detector test mean anything? I think what it means is he's not a total idiot. As we've discussed, those tests are unreliable and the results can be damaged by the proctor's opinion. And several times we have pointed out how you can end up with false positives to deception regarding those tests and with specific questions. He claims that he has turned down this polygraph request at the advice of his attorney. What are the other possibilities? Well, like, did Craig's dad help in any way? Mm -hmm. This could be an interesting angle, but the thing I have to wonder here, Captain, is I feel like there isn't much on his testimony as far as what he was doing or where he was, but I would have to guess, I would wager that this was probably looked into and was investigated. I mean, it could be a possibility, but I also think that it's quite unlikely. I think that there would have been something connecting the dad to it or connecting the dad to Craig as being some kind of assistant in all of this. Right. Maybe and, some eyewitness. Yeah. And I think investigators spent a good amount of time on this case. We talked about all the searches that were involved, not just in the Stebic home, in the greater Plainfield area, but all those searches inside the home and of the vehicles. You'd think that something somewhere would turn up. And I really want to know or have a good, I'd like to have a good understanding of what information we could pull from her phone because we know that she is on a site looking for a, a gym pal. Mm -hmm. it, you know, are we just hearing that she looked for a gym pal and it was only female? Is there more to that story? Because her car is still there. Right. And everything goes missing. So it's like, that makes a lot of sense. If you go, yeah, she came home. We got to prove that. We haven't been able to prove that. Mm. I think that's on her husband to prove. I think it's on her kids to prove. But then if she's at home and she leaves, we have eyewitnesses not that much later or some some eyewitnesses around that time that say, oh, yeah, he was working in his, in his backyard. Right. So... Is are some of these things set ups by a guy that knew how cases worked because mm -hmm. he was a private investigator, or is this a guy being cautious because he was a private investigator? And we've seen people get railroaded. We've seen people with no evidence, mm -hmm. but a false confession by somebody else doing life in prison or get death death row. Mm -hmm. So how would we react if something happened and 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 they were putting you on trial in the in the media spotlight well the public spotlight and other than that small amount of blood which i mean she lived at the home who knows that could have come from anything well from my other question would be how long did he own the truck mm -hmm. because they're together 14 years they had this tarp for however many years how long did they have the truck right so is it is it possible if they had the truck for six years that there's some blood somewhere? Mm -hmm. Possible. Well, and with her regards to her cell phone, 
Oh, sorry, let me backtrack just a quick second here. Okay. We were talking about what evidence is there against Craig. There's not much. And I think that's the big problem with this case. One, you know, the little small trace of blood, that could be evidence, but but it's hard to make that evidence. You have to almost make that evidence. Right. And then two, we have the, you know, people, family, friends later coming out saying, well, no, Lisa was afraid of him. Well, we, again, we don't know what was going on under that roof, what was going on inside those four walls. Right. It seems like a lot of hearsay. So then you have people that come out and say, well, if there's no evidence against Craig, you know, and that's why I brought up the father, his father. We know they were tight. Did his father help in some way? You have other people that say, well, Craig could have paid someone to get rid of Lisa. And I think this too is an interesting angle. However, I think this very much falls right into the last question about Craig's father. And I think this is an unlikely situation. I don't think this is what happened here right. Be because again, there would have been phone records or some type of communication between Craig and the hitman, some trail of evidence connecting the two of them. And you bring up a good, a good, interesting scenario here. Mm-hmm. Did she, in fact, leave the home, just like Craig said? Did she, in fact, intend to go to the gym that night and meet someone at the gym who later abducted and killed her? Right. This certainly is somewhat of a possibility, but in order for this to be more likely than what I think it is, she would, I think she would have had to have been abducted en route to the gym. You know, because we don't have anyone that says that they saw her at the gym that night. And you have to wonder how many people work out at a high school gym at six o'clock on that Monday night. Yeah. But if let's say she met this person before, then it was as simple. Hey, I'll pick you up. We'll go to the gym together. Mm -hmm. And so he picks her up or she picks her up. And when it, when it comes down to it, they just don't make it to the gym. Mm-hmm. I mean, I, I she is a a pretty small individual, mm -hmm. um, five two, one twenty. Mm -hmm. uh, this is uh, male or female could move her if she was deceased. You know, they could move the body. There's the other thought, and I know Craig has really pointed to this. You know, did she leave on her own accord? Did she go out to start up a new life? Personally, I think I would say if there were no kids, no children involved, that this could be the case. But right. I, I mean, I don't see any signs or any reason that she would abandon her kids. No one said that that would be in her character. We also have someone that is tattooing the names of her children on her body. Right. But that... That doesn't mean anything. Well, it means something to me. I, I feel like it, it means that they're special to her and that they hold some significance, some special place in her life. Yeah. And well, I, I think the runaway theory doesn't make a lot of sense because one, she didn't use any of her cards. We don't have any transactions. She didn't make enough money that she could stockpile enough to kind of get a new start. Mm -hmm. uh, and if you're going to get a new start again, is it is it possible that she's trying to better her life and then she just went, you know what? And I don't want to be a mom. It happens. Mm -hmm. It happens to dads. It happens to moms. It's just there's really no evidence of it. So, I mean, we can go down that rabbit hole, but until there's really evidence, I don't see what the point would be. We also have, um, you know, there are cases where, there's almost like an underground railroad situation where like these agencies for battered women will relocate them, but it's all very secretive, you know, and it's all very much, you have to drop everything and cut off all ties with your old life right. to go on and start a new one. And they never disclose that information. The thing is that doesn't happen a lot for many reasons the most important one and the most prominent one of those reasons is it's so hard for someone that has loved ones and people that they care about and children right. for them to sever all ties and to, to, to move on and create a new life elsewhere. The other thing I would point out here too, captain is the children were young. They're 10, they're 12. You know, these aren't 
grown adult children that are out making their own life and have moved on or moved away. Right. You know, these are people that children that were very much dependent on her as much as they are her husband, Craig. Yeah. I, I mean, isn't there some law? Can't they su- subpoena these kids and uh, so they can talk to them? Well, they did. They did. Um, and that's where, that's where it gets tricky again with Craig's situation. You know, they spoke with a grand jury. Nothing new apparently was gained from that. Now, this is, these are closed-door meetings. These are right. closed-door uh, interviews. So we don't know what was discussed. We don't know what was asked there. But apparently there was nothing, there was not enough inside that information or answers that they provided to this grand jury that would lead to the arrest and charges being filed against Craig Stevick. Bring in the new year with a new hair care routine from Madison Reed. Madison Reed is hair color reinvented, giving you gorgeous salon quality color delivered to your door for less than $25. That's right, less than $25. Remember, it's 2019 now. You don't have to choose between outdated box color or the time and the expense of the salon. That's why you'll want to check out Madison Reed. It's crafted in Italy by Master Colorist. Madison Reed is professional hair color you can easily do at home. And it's multi-tonal, ammonia-free, and made with ingredients you can feel good about. Our listeners have been going crazy about Madison Reed. And let me tell you, I've seen the pictures. I've seen the results. These women are looking gorgeous. Find your perfect shade from Madison Reed. Get an expert color consultation or take the color quiz at madison-reed.com. And True Crime Garage listeners get 10% off plus free shipping on their first color kit with code GARAGE. That's code GARAGE at madison-reed.com. Madison Reed, treat yourself. Chris Pine and India Isley star in the new limited series, I Am the Night on TNT. From Patty Jenkins, the director of Wonder Woman, this gripping new true crime series is inspired by the story of Fauna Hodel, a teenage girl who is given away at birth and grows up outside of Arena, Nevada. Fauna lives comfortably with the mysteries of her origin until one day she makes a discovery that leads her to question everything. As Fauna begins to investigate the secrets of her past, she meets Jay Singletary, a former Marine turned hack reporter who is haunted by the case that undid him. Together, they follow a sinister trail that swirls ever closer to the infamous Los Angeles gynecologist named Dr. George Hodel, a man involved in some of uh, Hollywood's darkest debauchery and possibly its most infamous unsolved case. Don't miss the series premiere, I Am The Night, January 28th at 9, 8 central on TNT. Visit IamTheNight.com for exclusive behind-the-scenes content and follow the show on social media at I Am The Night TNT. Support for today's show comes from ButcherBox. ButcherBox delivers healthy, 100% grass-fed and grass-finished beef free-range organic chicken, and heritage breed pork, and now wild Alaskan salmon, which is as fresh and nutrient-rich as it gets. Just choose from a variety of curated boxes or customize your own box to get exactly what you and your family love. All meats are frozen at the peak of freshness and individual vacuum-packed, biodegradable packaging and delivered right to your doorstep. It's incredibly convenient, and you can choose your delivery frequency with the customizable subscription. And you can cook with the peace of mind knowing that all butcher box meats come from humanely raised open pasture animals that are never fed antibiotics, hormones, or fatty fillers. Let me just tell you something about butcher box. I finally became a man this week because I got mine delivered to me. It might be the coolest thing that I've ever had delivered to my door. And the quality of the meat, Captain, is like one of the best butcher shops in America. Sent right to my door, and the packaging was absolutely brilliant. Yeah, I was I was blown away. For $20 off your first box and two pounds of free salmon, go to butcherbox.com slash garage and enter garage. That's butcherbox.com slash garage and enter promo code garage for $20 off your first box and two pounds of free salmon. 
Check out butcherbox.com slash garage today. All right, we're back. Ahoy. Ahoy. And a big cheers to everybody out there. Yeah, so with this case, I, I don't see the evidence or any indication that she would be running away. Mm-hmm. Like, it seems like there's definitely evidence that she wants to change some things in her life and better some things in her life, but not her just getting up and leaving. Mm-hmm. Well, she's making moves, too, within the divorce proceedings. You know, it's it's not like... Oh, this is happening. He filed for divorce and she's just dragging her feet waiting for it to happen. You know, we see the situation of the eviction notice. We see the situation of her going ahead and moving on with her life. We see a situation of her getting her daughter's name tattooed on her body and then telling friends that she wants a tattoo of her son's name. You know, these are all things. This this to me all points to somebody that has a, a planned future things that she is looking forward to, right. not things that she is running away from or even sitting back and denying that they are happening. Well, and you also wonder, too, if she's been with this guy for 14 years that is, quote, unquote, verbally abusive, did she meet somebody that might not treat her the best? And we just don't know about it. But she's willing to put up with that because she that's what she's known for 14 years. I mean, you'd think that what they would have found some kind of information on that home computer. Right. And I think, you know, that's where they're going to get all the information regarding these uh, connection sites that she was vo- involved in. Because one thing we got to keep in mind in regards to her cell phone. First off, this is 2007. OK, so her cell phone is automatically different from the ones that we have in 2019. But then on top of that, it's, it's often reported that this is an older cell phone right? as of 2007. So probably pretty primitive compared to what we are using today. Yeah. Zach Morris called. He wants his phone back. Well, and I have to wonder, I'm, I'm guessing here that we have a phone that doesn't even have internet capabilities. Possibly. That this yeah. is just a, uh, a a phone used to call people, maybe text people as well. So, But that brings up an interesting question, one that is posed in this case. Did Lisa meet someone online and then she agreed to meet with this person? This is possible, but the problem with this question here is, is this was investigated and pretty thoroughly as well. Well, we could answer some of the questions. Some of these questions could be answered by, was he at work? Because he claims he came home at about 5.45, 6 o'clock. Yeah, says he was home at about 5.40 p.m. that night. And that's because he was at work. Correct. So do we have anything? And I know he bounces around from site to site, but some of these cars have gps tracking for a different job you know for different companies Mm -hmm. like we saw in the chris watts case right do we have any evidence that he was gone uh, until he said he was well what we don't have is anyone disputing that he wasn't where he says he was right um so i really feel like the the time frame in question is after 5 40 p.m. that night we don't have anyone to say any differently that he wasn't where he says he was so just real quick back to did she meet someone and and this is i don't necessarily mean did she meet someone and decide oh you're my knight in shining armor or i fell in love with you let's run away together i don't mean that at all i mean someone that that was there to deceive her you know someone that she met through one of these connection sites and they did something bad to her and took her from her life. Right. And the thing is though, like I said, I think this, because some people have pointed out, look, someone on there, just like you talked about in yesterday's show, you could have somebody on there pretending to be a woman yeah. and communicating with her the old catfish and then setting up a, Hey, let's meet up or let's go for a jog together. I'll meet you at the gym or you meet me here on your way to the gym. 
Yeah. And then she never shows up again. Again, the problem with this is you, you feel like that the investigation really had very quickly nowhere else to go other than Craig Stebbick. And I think, again, there would have been breadcrumbs found on that computer, found within those connection sites that would have said she was talking to somebody. Yeah, and here's, okay, here's where I feel bad for him. Mm -hmm. Initially, he called. We have a situation, take the Chris Watts case, right? Right. It's, it's, uh, It's been on my mind, so from time to time. So that's a situation where he... He's not really telling anybody anybody's missing. He's just kind of going about his business. Yeah. He's, he's waiting for other people to say, hey, something's up here. We need to call the cops. Not only that, he's at, he's offering an explanation that why they are not at home. Chris Watts is. Right. He's saying, They're hey, on they, a play date. they went on a play date, and yeah. I don't know the person's name or where they live. Yeah, piece of shit. Uh, so, but here we have a case where you go, you could say, yeah, well, he didn't call. Captain. He didn't call till the next day. Well, they're getting separated. They're not going to be married anymore. This is going to be his normal life going forward. Maybe he's pretending it's already his normal life. She's going out. And like we said, she'd go out till 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock. Mm-hmm. Is it possible that he fell asleep to even know that she didn't come home? Mm-hmm. Right? Mm-hmm. Maybe he wasn't worried the night before. Right. Maybe he didn't think about it. Then the next day, he's going, what the fuck is going on? Right. Where is she at? Guess who calls the cops? Guess who starts going, hello? She's missing. Well, he doesn't call the cops, but he does call a couple of people to find out if they know where she is. Right. But didn't he, the one of the people that he talked to, they called the cops. Yeah. But again, the person it's, it's very unclear as to the situation, right? But one thing that I'm pretty certain of, it seems like the neighbor that he called to find out where his wife could be, right? That the neighbor was close with Lisa and, and that they were like friends. The couples were friends, you know, uh, the, the husband and wife, husband and wife, they hung out together. But I feel like the neighbor that he contacted and the neighbor is the one that goes, oh, there's something fishy going on here. Right. And they're the one that decide. I don't think he prompted them to call the police. Right. But one would argue, again, this guy was a private investigator. He's no dummy. Right. Mm-hmm. One could argue by calling other people. You called her work. Mm-hmm. You're calling people. You're that, notifying people that she's missing. You're notifying. Yeah, right. You're notifying the people. And on top of that, you're the one that that's that's throwing up flags in his favor, in his favor. Innocent. That's right. He's saying, hey, you know, did he call cops right away? No, because he was calling people. So we don't know if he would have eventually, you know, after five calls, maybe he would have called the police mm-hmm. or you know, if he returned home from work that day would have called the police. Right. Right, at some point. He, but he's calling her work. Again, it's one of those things where on one side you go, oh, that's a play, you sneaky bastard. Mm-hmm. And that's just you setting it up. You got rid of her the night before. You bought your kids candy to keep their mouths shut. And guess what? Now you're just uh, you're you're dropping off this information leading to, you want to make people believe that you're concerned. But then on the other hand, you go, well, maybe that's just the truth because there th- there is a logical explanation to his actions there. So it's, it's and then he goes, here's the computer. Well, how much time did he spend making sure that they would find exactly what they found on the computer? Mm-hmm. And maybe it or was, erasing what they didn't find. Right. And what I mean by that is it doesn't have to be, you know, like a, a Casey Anthony where it's like. Uh, Craig came home and, and Googled how to murder a wife and get away with it. Right. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's not something like that, but maybe it was a dating website that she was on that he got rid of. Mm -hmm. Again, 
I don't know what his uh, knowledge is of computers, and I would assume that law enforcement has better techs that would right. be, be able right. to uncover that information. Th- that's the thing. We've seen plenty of cases where people think they're pretty good at wiping clean a computer or a device. Police get their hands on it, and very quickly they're like, what about this? What about this? Mm-hmm. What about that? Because what they don't know is they call the garage, and they go, wing, 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 wing. Is is the colonel there? We need him to check out this computer. Mm-hmm. And then you find every, but what I'm everything saying is, that's encrypted, I will find. So then he goes, okay, uh, yes, we're trying to find my soon to be ex-wife. I'm helping you. Here's the computer. I'm talking to you. Some things get said. And then he goes, oh, I've seen this story before. And he shuts it down. And can you blame the guy? You can't blame the guy. Mm-hmm. But that again, it's one of those things where logically you go one direction is this guy is trying to protect himself, trying to protect his kids, trying to protect his family. On the other hand, you go, that seems fishy. That That is fishy as the fish sticks that they serve during lunch. Well, and here's the thing, too, because a lot of times, and I would say 99% of the time, 99% of the time. <laughs> We have a situation where people are like, you know what? He does not report her missing. He does not call police. That is a giant red flag against him. I think the thing that everybody needs to keep in mind here is that can we all agree that this scenario is unique in the sense that every bit of evidence that we can find points to the fact that they were both walking away from this relationship. Right. They were both walking away. Maybe in a situation if if she were, and this is not the truth, but if she were running around on him, you'd go, well, that's a red flag. He didn't report her missing. He didn't, he didn't get scared. He didn't get nervous that she wasn't coming home. Right. That's a red flag. No, they were both walking away from this relationship regardless of what was going on inside that home. So therefore, to me, I almost feel like a different reaction to her not coming home is what I would actually expect in this situation. Mm -hmm. Meaning either a, he was a bit upset. Oh, what? She's just not going to come home now. Mm -hmm. Oh, I'll call a few people, but I'm not going to waste my time on it. I got kids. I got to get to school. I got a job. I got to show up to, right. Or the other one that we've talked about a few times here too. Did he just not care? Did he just go, well, whatever this is over. I've, I've already, emotionally walked away from this relationship a while ago. Right. But hold on. You're talking about just the fact that he didn't report her missing. Right. Where, where many, right, many people would say that's a red flag against him. I almost feel like if I were in this situation, I would think that it's a, it's in his favor that he felt differently or at least appears from the outside to have felt differently. Yeah. But I don't look at that like that at all. I mean, he could have been going, I'm going to call her work. I'm going to call some of her friends. Well, then you call the neighbor and they call the cops. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, you didn't report it, but you called the neighbor. So it's not like you hid it from anybody. Right. Indirectly, you reported it. So, you know what I mean? Like, oh, he he didn't report it, but somebody did. So at that point, for all we know, the neighbor said, hey, guess what? I called the cops or the cops came to his house and why he's calling and still looking for. Okay. Now we're doing this. You know, so it's so weird because there's so many things that it's like, you easily go, ah, this guy, I don't like him. <sniffs> he smells like a turd. And then there's other parts where you go, oh, I see what, you know, a sane person would do that or somebody that actually cared about her. You know, and again, they're going through a divorce. There's anger there. But at the end of the day, they're together for 14 years. He probably cares about her on some level. There's the mother of his kids. It's so, it's just, it's so weird. It's like he calls, I mean, just that that's as simple as it can be. He calls her work to figure out if she made it to work. That's either a cover up or he gives a shit. And like, that's what where almost every piece of evidence points. And, and that's really frustrating. And if he's not guilty of anything, you know, this is, uh, I feel bad for him. Well, here's the other thing you got to wonder about, right? For, for the future of his life separated from his ex-wife, 
doesn't having her around make it easier for him? Yeah. And what I mean by that, look, if they're having money problems, they're separating. They're going to share those money problems even after they separate. Um, it, it, it eases his burden a little bit. And the other thing too, is they both planned on shared parenting as a single, as a, a now single man, he right. has somebody that it, he can trust more than anyone else to watch his children a few nights a week. Right. You know? So what I'm getting at, it seems a little easier for him that, that she be around. There doesn't seem to be a situation where he's running around on her and just has to get out of this marriage and can't come up with any better idea than to turn in Chris Watts and end it all. Right. Well, well, I agree with that. But then I start thinking that maybe it's a situation where he goes, I'm in control. I make 80 grand. You make 10 grand. And she starts playing the system a little bit and goes, you know what? I can actually get you out of the house. Maybe I can win this house in the divorce. Because, look, anybody that's gone through a big breakup sp- Let's just say you live with the person. You don't have to be married to the person. But several times, I'd sit down at a table. You know, we need to talk about what we're splitting up. Okay, this is how I think things will go, right? That's maybe somebody lays out to you. I'm going to keep the house. You keep this car. You do this, right? All that can change in an argument, you see what I'm saying? No, I get, I get it. And so is, so motive could be a lot more than money and custody. It could be a bunch of stuff where it's this person maybe didn't really care so much. He filed for a divorce, but now it's all, all of a sudden shifting, and she starts going, well, you were verbally abusive, and you did all this stuff, and I'm going to take everything I can. And then he's going, wait a second, this is not how it's supposed to go. We're supposed to both this walk away. Mm-hmm. Is but, that enough for somebody to snap and kill somebody? I believe so. She could have threatened him with that, but from the outside looking in, I don't see much in the way of property. I mean, I just don't see it. You know what I mean? It seems like. Well, I mean, she filed for him to be evicted from the house. Right. I mean, that's evidence of. That's just a place to stay until they get until the divorce is final, though. Right, but what I'm saying, the difference is is that the the communication could have been, you know, you're going to, you know, he, he paid for the house. Maybe if she's only making 10000 bucks, you think he really needed her help to pay for the house? Probably not. No, no, I don't think so. And so what I'm saying is the, the conversation could have been, well, I'm going to keep the house because I paid on it. And she's like, yeah, no big deal. And we're going to do shared parenting. But yeah, there's no big deal. But what I'm getting at is it's, it's, I see what you're saying, but the, the problem in that though, to go to the extent of killing somebody, there's no equity in that home. It's not like you're losing something. Right. But sometimes people are grasping at straws to hold on to some stability of their life is what I mean. I, and I know that sounds like... I think, Silly, it's, but I think saying, if, if it's he, a stretch is what I'm saying. So I'm not leaning towards that. I'm just saying I could see that. And that's what make like I said, back to the, my main point and my final wrap up of the case in my eyes is either almost everything in this case points to that's fishy. And I kind of understand why he did it. Does that make sense? You, you kind of understand why he killed his wife no 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 I'm no saying, you, you kind of understand why people suspect him no 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 what i'm saying is like just take any point of evidence any knowledge that we have it's like he called it her work it's like part of me goes oh that's him covering up that he did something to her right and the other part of me goes no he was actually looking for her right. but it's like there's so much stuff that does that where like at first he's talking to the cops and then he stops talking to the cops. And it's like, I see, does that make sense? Yeah. Well, but one thing, one possibility we didn't get to yet is did some random person grab her off the street and kill her. And this, I actually believe to be one of the more probable scenarios for a couple of reasons. One, the weather was not bad that night from what I could find. It wasn't perfect, but what if she took off on a jog? You know, Plainfield is a safe area, but we have covered 
just in the past year, at least three incidences of a lady going out jogging by herself and some snake in the grass evil man sees her and attacks her. Um, right. So it's even though this is a safe area, you have to keep in mind, unfortunately, this stuff can happen anywhere. And I think that this might be somewhat possible because of the items missing. You know, we have uh, the purse is a bit tricky. I don't know anybody that goes out jogging with their purse, but I would expect her to take her cell phone with her. We also know that the area was safe enough and at least the weather was nice enough for the father to send a 12 and 10 year old, you know, kids out on a bike ride in search of candy. Right. So that is a possible interesting angle here. And we know that she jogged in the park across the street from their home. This wouldn't require her to take her car. This wouldn't require her to tell anyone where she was going. Well, and also she could have taken her purse and put it on a bench while she's running. Mm -hmm. As long as she knows that she can see the bench while she's running. I, I've seen people do that a lot. The problem, though, here, Captain, is, you know, could this case just ultimately be a dead end? Because I hope not. What I mean by this is I, I've so many cases that we've covered. There's very few, what maybe two that I can think of that it seems like a person just straight up and vanished. Right. And with her situation, it doesn't seem like she was in charge of going missing. I feel like between her close friends, all the things that came out later, I feel like Lisa was a bit of an open book to her friends in her close you know, relatives. Right. And so therefore I kind of feel like this is a situation where she may have vanished for unknown reasons. And the answer could be right in front of us. It really could, but there's nothing to connect. There's nothing solid and concrete to connect Craig as 100% your guy. And let, let me just ask you a couple questions. If you, if you can answer these and I know I'm going back a little bit, but she leaves work. What time? At 2.30. And then... This would be a pretty normal time for her to leave work. And what time does the kid need picked up? 3.30. So and 3:30. we know that she stopped and got a sandwich somewhere along the way. Right. So we have her whereabouts up to, let's say, about 3 o'clock. Somebody picks up the kid. We don't know if it's her. Don't know if it's the husband. Mm -hmm. They get back to... That puts them back to the house... Pick the kid up at 3.30, wait in line a little bit, roughly about 4 o'clock. Mm -hmm. The neighbors see him roughly around 6, 6.30, um, 6 7. No, I, I don't know exactly when they see him um, right. or if they even claim to have seen him at all. What here Here's what I think is concrete in this in this case, and this is coming from law enforcement. Law enforcement has stated that they believe that Lisa Stebick was in the home when the children left to go to Walgreens to get candy. This would have been shortly after Craig came home from work at 5.40 p.m. Mm -hmm. Then when they returned sometime between 6.30 and 6.45 p.m., Lisa Stebick was not in the home, but so, Craig was. Right. And we do know that they, even though the communication was cut off at some point, law enforcement did speak with the children. Right. Yeah, at first. Yeah. And so what's interesting here is you have an hour. You have an hour that you have to. Now, they talk to the kids, so I'm assuming that the kids are saying, yeah, our dad was there when we got back. Our mom wasn't. Mm -hmm. That gives them an hour. And if people saw him digging in his backyard or whatever that, you know, working in the backyard, whatever, they brought dogs in. Mm -hmm. Nothing. No scent picked up. You would think they would have picked something up. Case would be solved. But that an hour is not a big window. Well, a, a good friend of mine who lives in Illinois, he's a retired uh, firefighter. He has a theory that basically ends with Craig killed Lisa at some point and was planning it for months, and she's in the ground at their property. Really? I... Greg is uh, shout out to my buddy, Greg. Mm -hmm. Thanks for all your, he just retired recently as a firefighter. So thanks for all your years as a first responder. Right, I think his theory is very interesting. He claims that she would be 
Um, at least she's probably in some kind of container, maybe a barrel or something that he put in the ground at some point, And yeah. that this barrel would be at least three feet or deeper in the ground. And he's, his thought is that they need to use uh, sonar you know, ground penetrating sonar to see if there's anything on that property. Right. There's a couple of, there's a couple of things that I, I throw in there to, to poke a hole or at least question that theory. I think it's a good one, but I saw that the property was listed for sale at some point. Mm-hmm. This is not a large property. It would be interesting. You know, you and I have talked so many times about in these cases what can we prove and what can we disprove? Is there any theory or anything along our list that we can at least scratch off, even if we can't find Lisa's remains on the Stebic property that they used to own? Mm-hmm. Can we at least go, well, that's not a possibility because we've searched it properly and we know that that cannot be. Right. And so it would be interesting. That's not a large property. It's a regular neighborhood. So I'm guessing from pictures, we're probably talking about a quarter acre lot ish. Mm -hmm. somewhere in there. So it wouldn't take long to scan that property and see if there's anything hiding in the ground there. But I would love, I would love for the current homeowners to give consent for that to happen. And I'm sure there's somewhere, someone out there that followed this case, maybe even to this day that would be willing to help in that detection of if there's any anomaly in the ground there. Well, the reason why I would like that theory is the idea, like I said, it's not a lot of time from the time that the children leave. Yeah, 45 minutes, maybe an hour. Right. This guy would have had to have moved quick. Yeah, but if you plan this a week in advance, well, then you'd have everything ready. All, all you'd have to do is kill her, put her in the container, and then bury it. It's an interesting case, but a very sad one, too. Because I kind of feel like unless Lisa's now grown adult children come forward with something new, right. with something that they have not spoke about yet, some kind of new information, this is a cold case, and I think it might just keep getting colder. Do you have a number to call if anybody has in, any information? Uh, we can look up the Plainfield Police Department. The number is area code 815-436-2341. 815-436-2341. Four three six two three four one. Support for this podcast and the following message comes from TNT and the new limited series I Am the Night. This thrilling new true crime series stars Chris Pine. It is inspired by the incredible true story of Fauna Hodel and Hollywood's most infamous unsolved murder, the Black Dahlia. Don't miss I Am the Night, Mondays at 9, 8 central, premiering January 28th on TNT. Go to IamTheNight.com for more. Thanks to everybody for joining us in the garage this week. We will see you back here next week. Until then, be good, be kind, and don't litter.